My name is John Coons, and what I'm presenting here is the text, uh, some information about the Texas Hill Country Loop, um, which is one of the ACA uh, loop rides. Uh, and I did this in, I think, 2016, within a few weeks after it came out, because I was, I live in Austin, Texas. I've been here for nearly 40 years. And I was very excited about doing this uh, loop. So I think I was the first person to actually do it after the maps were officially uh, put out there. So what I'm gonna try to do is talk to about some of the things uh, to know about this loop and talk about equipment and bikes and all that kind of thing. I'm kind of gearing this to somebody who may have never done a tour before. So some of you epic tour riders, you know, you know, might be bored by some of it, but hopefully I'm gonna have some information in here that will be good for everybody who's interested in doing this particular ride. The first thing I wanna say is about types of bikes. There's a lot of different types of bikes and the best type of bike is the bike that you love, love to ride. So different types of tours, you know, are better suited for different types of bikes. You know, in the bottom left corner there is a folding bike. If you're doing a tour that has maybe some public transportation involved with it to get from place to place, that could be a great option. You know, in the top left, there's a, a, a tandem. Uh, you, you know, if you already have uh, maybe a divorce lawyer in your family who can give you a good deal, uh, you know, that might be good for you. Joking. They're fun to ride and uh, they can bring people really close together too. So, you know, a tandem could be a great way when you have somebody who's maybe a stronger rider and maybe a weaker rider and you ride together and you work it out. So, you know, that's a great option. There's uh, gravel bikes, touring bikes, there's mountain bikes, there's recumbent bikes. There's a lot of different options, but again, don't get hung up on the equipment. The equipment is important, but only to a point. Bicycles have been around for over 100 years, and they haven't really changed that much, really. The most important thing is the adventure, not the equipment. So that's just kind of something to consider. On the left is my one of my bikes, my uh, Tadpole Trike that I had after I had surgery. Uh, if you were to use a recumbent bike, uh, on this particular tour, I'd, I would do this. I built this mast, this kind of safety mast out of PVC where I could put my lights way up high. Um, because of the hill country being, wait for it, hilly, I felt like traffic, fast moving traffic coming up from behind over lots and lots of rolling hills. Like the sooner they could see my red tail light or my white blinky, you know, forward facing light, the better. So just, just an idea. And then uh, my hairnet here on the right, which I use even for commuting, I've got my headlight and my tail light on this helmet. So it's mounted up as high as possible. And I find that that gives just a, even just a, a second, half a second more warning for somebody coming up from behind me, you know, over the top of a hill. So that's just something to kind of consider uh, on this on this tour. Uh, another question comes down to, aside from the bike type, whether or not you can use a trailer. So when I did this tour, I used a combination of pannier bags and a trailer. And I'm a utility cyclist. I'm car free. So I use trailers all the time. I love trailers. I really wanted to love the trailer on this tour, but really about five miles in, I almost turned back to come home to just ditch the trailer and just get my, my other pannier bags. Um, again, this is a personal preference. I would suggest you try it out before you commit yourself to a long tour, uh, just because you're going to be stuck with it one way or another. I found that the 17 pound trailer was just basically extra 17 pounds I was hauling. Also, the problem with the trailer is when you pull up, let's say, to a grocery store and you're trying to maneuver your bike into that little space where there's no bike rack, by the way, out there in the hill country, there's, there's no bike racks. Uh, so you're trying to 
like find some place where you can lock your bike frame up to something, you know, you better be good at backing trailers because it can be really hard to maneuver a trailer around in those kinds of situations. So it's just something to consider. Um, they are nice and you can drop them off and go on, you know, a separate ride without having to bring all your extra equipment. So there are pluses and minuses uh, to using a trailer. As far as your, your bike setup, there's a lot of different options. Um, my recommendation is that you use all your equipment before your tour. It's kind of like doing a triathlon. Never do something new on the day of a triathlon. Never do something new on the day of your tour. Make sure you've tested out all of your equipment, all of your uh, gear choices, your camping system, sleep system, you know, your, your food system, hydration, all that. Make sure everything's been tested out. Don't do anything new on the first day of a tour. I like to bring lots of uh, spare parts. I've had lots of different things break on different tours. So I carry inner tubes, all the Allen keys I need to do all the kinds of repairs, spare spokes. Uh, ACA sells these, these stringy sort of spoke replacement parts, which are great. Duct tape, zip ties, don't even go out the door without zip ties. I carry a derailleur hanger, a chain breaking tool, um, and extra pieces of chain, puncture repair kit, spare cables, everything I could possibly use to keep myself going on the road. The longer your tour, the more you want to uh, plan for that. If you're going on some epic quest across, you know, Asia, I would recommend that you take your bike, you completely disassemble it to every last individual component and put it back together again on your own and make sure you're carrying all the tools to actually do that. Make sure you're totally familiar with everything on that bike so that when something breaks out there in the middle of nowhere and you're a thousand miles from the nearest bike shop, then you're, you're better situated to make the repairs that you need to make. Again, it's not so important for a bike overnight weekend thing. If you can call somebody, you know, bail you out. And I've had that happen too. It's not quite as important. But definitely, the longer your tour, the more time you want to spend on actually being really prepared and making sure you really go through everything carefully. Here's an example right here. I had these deep uh, rims on my touring bike, and I did a tour out in West Texas, completed the tour, no problems. I brought extra tubes, didn't have to use any of them. A couple of days after the tour, I got a flat. I was trying, I was kind of in a hurry to get to where I was going. So instead of patching it, I decided to just swap out for a new inner tube. And I found out that yes, I had inner tubes, but I didn't have a long enough valve stem on the inner tube to get through these deep rims. So had that happened 10 days earlier out there on that West Texas tour, I would have really totally been out of luck if my patch kit didn't work or if I couldn't patch the, or if the tear was too much to patch up with the patch kit. So don't, don't forget to take the time to go through all of your equipment very thoroughly so that you don't get caught out uh, with a, a, you know, a small, a small thing that kills your tour. As far as different types of touring goes, there's a lot of different options. So on the top left corner here, you got adventure cycling has, uh, you know, supported tours. I've never done one. I'd love to do it sometime. Uh, that would be a great option. There's no bad way to tour. It's whatever you want to do and just have fun doing it. It doesn't really matter um, how you do it. It matters that you have fun doing it. The advantage of a supported tour is if you just bonk or you just wiped out or weather turns, you know, bad on you, you can get bailed out and you can get to the campsite. Top right, you know, you could have a family member follow behind and carry all your main equipment and meet you at a campsite and support you along the way. And that's a great way to go. You know, bottom right corner, you can do a credit card tour. Just a bare minimum amount of equipment, fast bike. And just, you could, the Hill Country, the Texas Hill Country Loop would be a fantastic credit card tour. If you just zip through it, um, and stayed in motels, uh, B&Bs, 
Airbnbs, warm showers and such, you could do a fantastic tour just doing it that way. And given the hills, uh, that could be a great way to go. And the bottom left corner is me on one of my hill country tours, you know, fully loaded down, totally self-supported. Uh, nobody was coming out to get me. And I had to be able to, you know, take care of myself on the ride, which here's an example of. So on one of my tours, I can't remember which one, I think I was, I think I rented a car and rode out, drove out to Del Rio and then rode back home to Austin. And I hit something, at any rate, the whole front pannier rack shattered, fell off. And I was sitting on the side of the road trying to make repairs. And I was able to reattach the front pannier rack using zip ties, the little nuts that you have on the Presto valves. I always save them. I always have extras on there. And uh, a juice lid that I found on the side of the road. And I punched a hole with my awl for my multi-tool multi and was able to make a washer and I was able to rig this system up so that I could get to the next big town where there was a hardware store and I was able to rebuild the whole uh, system. So if you're going out alone, especially, you got to be more prepared. You know, the more people you have, the more you could spread out some of the gear, uh, repair equipment, cooking equipment, and, and, and all that. So if you're alone, you're in a place like West Texas, you definitely want to be prepared to take care of yourself uh, when something goes wrong and something will go wrong. It's almost guaranteed. It wouldn't be a fun trip if you didn't have something to go wrong to tell your grandkids about. As far as accommodations go, you got a lot of different choices. You can go with a bivy sack. You can go with a tent. You can stay in motels. A couple of the camp uh, state parks along the Hill Country Loop have these wonderful shelters. The one on the bottom right corner is at Blanco State Park. Blanco State Park and Inks Lake, both on the Hill Country Loop Trail, have shelters, but you gotta reserve them in advance. They're really great, especially in Blanco because you can, you can just stay there. I, I one time stayed in this particular one during a horrible pouring rainstorm and it was so nice not having to worry about anything getting wet. And in Blanco, the town's like a few blocks away from here, the town square. And there's like three different really good restaurants. Uh, Real Ale Brewery is right down the street. Uh, so if you're a fan of craft beer, you're in luck there. It's a wonderful town to stop at. Um, and being able to just walk back to a shelter can be a really nice break on this tour. So I kind of recommend that as an option. Here's my preferred uh, way of camping out. I just pulled my front wheel off. I use some guy wires to stake out the frame so it doesn't fall over. I use my tarp and I stretch it out over the, my brook saddle. And then I use my front wheel to push in in the back as a kind of a tent pole and that works really well and this is great because I can set this up even if there's no trees around to set up a ridge line or any of that kind of stuff I prefer using a tarp personally because I found that I don't get wet from condensation as I would in a tent I've used tarps everything from camping on the beach to camping above the tree line in Colorado to everything and personally I prefer that Different people have different preferences. It's all good. Go with what works for you. But I'm just throwing this out here as an option. Of course, when you get up in the middle of the night uh, to go to the bathroom, you will trip over this wire here, this uh, cord, parachute cord, and you will knock it all down in the middle of the night. So just be prepared for that. It will happen. As far as cooking goes, uh, you got a lot of options there. Uh, my daughter and I are planning to do the bike overnight thing, and we're trying to figure out a way we can get by without bringing any cooking at all for just a bike overnight. So that's an option is to not bring any cooking gear at all. In the top left corner here, you have an alcohol stove. You can make these out of two beer cans. Um, there's thousands of YouTube videos on this. It's great fun. Uh, you can light your whole kitchen on fire like I did. 
lots of blue flames everywhere with the fuel that you use, very pretty blue flames uh, all over your floor and your kitchen. Um, they're great. I think actually these are illegal in California for good reasons and that you can not just burn down your kitchen, but you can burn down, you know, a whole forest. So check your local regulations on that before you go out and use one of these. They're fun to use. They do have some drawbacks and that the way the, the type of fuel burns, it's very hard to see unless it's dark. And so sometimes you can actually have a fire and not realize it and the fire can get outside of the container. So that's something to be careful about. On the bright side, they are very light. So always trade-offs. The bottom middle there is a propane. You know, of course you're wasting these canisters. It's kind of wasteful, but they're great because they do work really well, very reliably. So that's an option. The one on the top right is MSR International. I have one of these. It burns everything from jet fuel, diesel, anything you can burn, you can run this stove off. And I've done tours where I've used this, um, it's just using gasoline from gas stations. And there's nothing more fun than going into a West Texas gas station and buying five cents worth of gasoline uh, and looking at the expression on the, on the uh, you know, the worker's face when you buy, pay, uh, five, fill her up, be five cents. That's could be the best part of the tour. As far as uh, more accommodation information here, gorilla camping is possible, but it's hard to do in Texas because 98% of the state of Texas is privately owned. The 2% of Texas that's not privately owned is Big Bend National Park, which is the Chihuahuan Desert and Guadalupe Mountains and the state park system, but and maybe a few city parks but almost all the states privately owned. So you have to keep that in mind. This is not Colorado or New Mexico where there's BLM land, national forest land, where you can just get off the road, get out of sight and hunker down for the night. It's not like that here. So you've got to pay attention to that. And I play a game as I'm, if I've never, I don't drive, but if somebody's driving and I'm in the car, I play a game where I, I go down the road and look, okay, if I was on a bike tour, and I had to stop, where would I stop? And it's really hard to find a good gorilla camping spot. This particular one's out someplace out in West Texas on one of my tours. And I hunkered down behind a rock pile that Texas Department of Transportation had a pile of rocks for road repair. And I hunkered down behind there. I used my bandanas to cover up all the reflective surfaces on my bike. <laughs> kind of funny because there I'm going from being very visible to okay, make a hole and, and disappear into it so nobody sees me at night so you can do it it's hard to do if you see purple it means no trespassing also the people that put purple on mean they know they know this and they're serious so while you might see a bedraggled old no trespassing sign and uh, maybe you can i don't know maybe you might, it may not be that serious but if you see purple it means they, they're serious about that. And that means they don't want you on their land. So you got to respect that. Another thing you can do is just ask for help. I took this picture on one of my tours. I, I did a ride across Texas from the low tide to the highest point at uh, 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 Guadalupe Peak. And I got to this one particular place and there was no room in the inn and no campgrounds. And I got turned away from an RV park because I didn't have an RV. And I just came across these guys who were standing in their front yard. And I just said, hey, and, and the way to do it is just be real open. Says, hey, my name's John. I'm from Austin. Real upbeat. Give me your name. Tell me where you're coming from. That way you're less threatening. And I said, hey, listen, I'm running out of options here. Would it be okay if I camped in your front yard? And they're like, yeah, sure, man. Yeah, sure. In fact, they offered me, you know, let me sleep in their van and stuff. But I was good here. So I set up my tarp and I was totally fine. These guys are really cool, but that's the way to do it. Just be real, throw yourself out there and be friendly, be polite and be respectful. Tell them your name at the start. Tell them, my na tell them your name, where you're from. That way they feel like, hey, you know what? If you did do something stupid, they would have a lead on tracking you down. So by being a little bit more vulnerable up front, which is, you know, kind of be scary to do 
but it's a better chance that they're going to be uh, have a positive response to you and uh, you know be willing to help you out. This is a map that shows roughly the Hill Country, ACA Hill Country Loop with an overlay of warm showers hosts. There's like a hundred in Austin. So no worries there. But once you get off that, you can see there's a couple. And you might look down here and see San Marcos, this town. Oh, that's not too bad. But I'm going to say that that road between Martindale and San Marcos is not something you really want to ride. Uh, you might be able to find some different ways to do that, but that's not as nice as it looks right there. So warm showers as you go through West Texas is not as great an option as it might be in other places, just to, uh, keep you, although these things change all the time. So this, I made this a couple of months ago in 2020, you know, maybe early summer of 2020. So you know, don't go by this slide. Look for yourself if you're in, if you're a warm showers, uh, uh, you know, person. You know, give they come and go, so that's an option. And overlaid on here is the bike shops along the route. So there's who knows how many in Austin, tons of them. But aside from Austin, you got one in New Braunfels and one in Fredericksburg, and that's it. So don't count on any kind of technical support along the way uh, for most of the route. So just something to consider as you're going along. Uh, some of the dangers in Texas, uh, water, you know, for most of the year, water is your biggest problem. Uh, my strategy is to, I have four water bottles on the bike frame and I carry an extra water bottle, an extra Nalgene bottle in one of my pannier bags as an emergency reserve. So as I'm going along, you know, I may forget which water bottle I'm drinking from off the frame. And, but if I get to the point where they're all depleted and I dig into that reserve, it's like I positively know that I'm digging into the reserve. Um, so that way I'm not caught out you know, by surprise that I have no water left because I have to actually dig out that water bottle from the bottom of the pannier bag. So just um, a thought. Water is definitely one of the limiting factors. As far as the natural uh, hazards here, from the top left, fire ants. If you see this uh, mound, it's kind of mottly, kind of brownish soil. It could be fire ants. They swarm, but they don't start biting until one of them gives a signal and they use pheromones. So you may not even know you're covered with fire ants if you're you know, preoccupied thinking about something else. And then once they start biting, they all bite at once and they can kill like baby deer. So they, they, they're nasty. Um, they're non-native species. They come from South America, but um, Look out for patches on the ground that look like fire ant mounds. They're real common after heavy rain uh, lots or a period of, of, of rain. So just be looking at that. If you're coming here, just Google fire ant mounds. Know what they look like, and then just don't camp there. Top right, scorpions. We don't have any seriously dangerous scorpions here. One time I had one of these guys in my boot. I was in there for a couple hours. I kept thinking, gosh, there's like a leaf in here. It's like rubbing on the top of my foot driving me crazy and after two hours i took my boot off and realized now yeah, it was a scorpion stinging me over and over again so not pleasant but you know obviously not that serious bottom left mesquite you got these big thorns you know just when you're trying to set up a tent, like I showed you this slide where I was camping in those guys' front yard, it was all mesquite bushes. And yes, I scraped my head on the mesquite bush branch getting up in the morning. So just be aware of that. Uh, another thing in the bottom right corner is prickly pear. Everything on the sides of the road in Texas has got sharp spines. So no big deal. It's just that when you're roll, when you're riding your when you're when you're when you're moving your bike off the pavement onto the ground, onto the dirt or the whatever on the side of the road, just 
realize that everything out there is sharp and spiny. So kind of be careful on that. You might lift your bike and carry it over uh, to some place where you're trying to put it down rather than let it go through the side of the road. Uh, another thing, fun thing, Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. You're not going to see them on the road, but you might if you're camping, especially if you're doing a gorilla camp, especially if you come to Texas during our best times, which is the spring and fall, March, April, and October are our best times when we have our most beautiful weather. Uh, these guys like to come out and sun themselves. I've seen a bunch of them over the years. All you got to do is ignore them, not ignore them, but walk around them, leave them alone. Don't try to hurt them. Don't kill them. Just leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. They don't want to bother you. Um, the, the, the youngest, the young ones are actually more dangerous than the older ones. But most of the time, if they do bite, they don't even inject venom into you. Uh, so just keep an eye out for them. They don't all, always rattle because people have been killing the rattlesnakes with that rattle. There's been selective pressure there and they've kind of adapted the species to where there's actually more of them now that don't rattle. So just keep your eyes open. They're very well camouflaged. Always watch where you're putting your feet. If you're lifting up logs, let's say you're in a campsite, you want to pick up a log because maybe you're going to make it a fire or you're moving something around. Never just reach your hand down into the ground to pick something up. You kick it with your, you know, use your, use your shoe, your boot, or your, your, you know, your, your foot, kick the log over to see what's there. Don't ever just reach down on the ground to pick something up in Texas. And if, as long as you just do that, you're going to be fine. Been here 40 years, haven't been bit once. The other fun thing in Texas is chip seal. If you're on a section of road that's asphalt, that's nice and smooth, enjoy it because in about a 20 feet, it's going to be over and you're going to be back on the chip seal. So make sure your tires are in good condition before you come down here. Uh, if your tires are like on the, yeah, I got a little bit more wear in these tires, yeah, consider switching them out, especially if you're down here for a while and going a long distance because this chip seal is really hard on tires. The other thing, the big danger we have down here is flash flooding. Central Texas, the biggest natural um, danger is flash flooding. This uh, particular section of road is on the southern tier, and it's also on the Hill Country Loop, which is that cutoff that they have between Fredericksburg and Austin if you decide to you know, cut the trip in half. If you look on Crazy Guy on a Bike, almost everybody on the southern tier takes a picture crossing this particular stream. It, this photo from Google Maps doesn't really do it justice. It's a really steep hill on the other side there. Uh, there's a fast moving stream at the bottom of it if it's flooding. I have personally been knocked down in the stream and lost a couple hundred dollars worth of equipment uh, because I was stupid and tried to ride through it. So don't do that. Don't try to ride through streams when there is like a super critical flow of the water. And if you don't know what super critical means, I'm not going to get into it. Do a, do a YouTube search on super critical. Know what super critical flow looks like. And don't ever go into a flash flood thing where there's that kind of super critical flow. Um, also, be aware that sometimes, even if it's not moving that fast, these roadbeds can get real slimy and covered with algae. If it hasn't, you know, rain for a while, it, it could be really tricky. So you'll want to get off and walk it, even if you think it's, if you decide it's safe enough to go ahead and walk through. So do be very careful with these stream crossings. Now, here's a great resource, atxfloods.com. Um, they will show you where all of the different low water crossings are that are closed. I highly recommend that if you're going to do this tour, and again, in the spring or the fall, the times we have rain here, do check this out and check it against the route to make sure that you're going to be able to do the route as it shows without making some sort of detour and be prepared to make some sort of detour uh, around these things because uh, they're not safe to cross. If, if, if the state has closed the water crossing, do not 
try to cross it. They're serious about that. They're very dangerous, and people die here every year trying to use uh, trying to get through low water crossings. Another fun thing in Texas is just the culture, and this not to make this political or anything, but uh, the farther you get out in the country right now, it's 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 fairly polarized politically. And I've done a lot of tours, and since basically since Obama was elected, almost every tour I've been on, somebody has approached me to try to engage me in a, in a political discussion. And being a middle-aged white guy, you know, basically most people assumed that I had, you know, far right-wing views. So what I'm trying to say here is if you're alone on a bicycle, you know, practice your, um, your uh, de-escalation skills. And if you don't have any, get some so that you can have discussions with the locals, learn about the culture, but don't engage in political debate um, because you're alone. And you can assume that everybody out there is, is, is packing, everybody's armed. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind, talk to people, learn about things, get to know them. I also want to add to this, by the way, that out there, people will give you the shirt off their back and so many times I have been riding along, maybe it started rain or I was going up a steep hill and somebody would pull up in their pickup truck, somebody who I probably wouldn't necessarily engage in conversation normally, but they would pull up and ask me if I was okay. Do I need water? They would give me water. Do you need a ride? You know, sometimes even, you know, they would come back and check on me to make sure I was, you know, making progress. So, it's uh, this, the uh, Texas Hill Country, you know, it's part of the South and the South has a very polite society. So be polite uh, and, you know, just kind of deescalate and, you you know, you're going to be okay. And if, if you get in trouble, ask, ask somebody to drive, flag somebody down, you know, because most likely a very friendly people out here and somebody will help you out if, you, if you're desperate for help. So it's a good thing out here. So here's uh, the Hill Country Loop marked out on uh, Map My Ride. Here's me starting on the day I started. I did this in one, two, three, four, five days. And I wish I'd spread it out to 10 because there's so much to see. And I did this just taking a few days off work to try to knock it out. But honestly, uh, there's so much to see and do. Don't make this into a high mileage event just take the time to enjoy what there is. So starting out, I live in North Austin, about four miles away from this beginning, or four miles away from where I can hook up with the trail. So here's some shots in the top left, North Austin. It's a pretty easy ride going down through Austin from once you're into Austin from the north. Bike lanes, uh, hilly, hilly area, the rich part of town. You go by uh, Lance Armstrong's old shop, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Mellow Johnny's, and then you get out to the east side of town, and there's a lot of country lanes. Now, nobody who lives here considers the stuff east of the interstate to be the hill country. It's got some low rolling hills, but it's not the hill country. And one of the first places you can stop at that's reasonable is Martindale. And in Martindale, there's a place called Shady Grove. It's on the uh, river. It's mainly set up for canoeists. And they like to have like 48 hours or 24 hours notice. They let me stay there because I'd done some races through there and all that, uh, canoe races and stuff. So they were okay with letting me stay. But, you know, it's a great place to stay, Shady Grove. Uh, check it out, you know, but contact them ahead of time and see if you can you know, get a campsite right there. They'll probably let you in. And then the beautiful town of Martindale, taco stands. Don't pass up the taco stands for breakfast. Great food. Never pass up a taco stand. There's a little shoe tree outside of Martindale as you're leaving Martindale going in a clockwise direction, which, by the way, is the way I recommend doing this tour, which we'll get to more later. And then just some pictures here showing 
what you're going to see on that east side of the tour, wild roses, and this rolling farm country. And then you get into New Braunfels. Here is the <laughs> Guadalupe River at near flood stage. The, the, the year I did it was near flood stage. And then this picture right here is coming out of New Braunfels, carrying on through the tour and just showing a very typical hill country farm to market road, FM road or ranch road, RR, ranch road. This is a scene along the Guadalupe River, limestone cliffs, beautiful, obviously a high, high water level here. And you can see in some places the water was actually just coming over the road surface. Very nice flat stretch between New Braunfels going up towards Lake Canyon or Canyon Lake, sorry going in a clockwise direction. But this section of the river, or the, uh, sorry, the route is a bit dangerous because on the weekends during the, the beautiful weather, there's a lot of tubers and they're drunk and they're driving up and down the road and you wanna be real careful of that. I would avoid the section between New Braunfels and Canyon Lake on a weekend. Now, there are a lot of campsites along this route so that could be a good thing. When I did this, everything was closed and it was just raining. But uh, it's a beautiful, fast section because it's flat right along the river. It's beautiful. You can, it's asphalt, so you just fly along this. It's beautiful, but do be careful during the weekends. You know, they're seeing little, it's very, very typical, beautiful hill country uh, scene right here. And then as you get farther out, you get higher up into the hills. This is a lower Cretaceous limestone for anybody who's a geology person. Lots of fossils in here. Hills are not like Colorado type climbs. They're intense climbs. They go for a little bit and then they're over with. So there's a lot of up and down, a lot of up and down. It, you're not climbing Independence Pass here, but it's going to be fairly steep for a short period of time and then sudden downhill and then another uphill another downhill that's why they called the hill country there's some beautiful roads along the way between canyon lake and blanco nice little county roads and it takes you to a place called fisher which if you look at the map it looks like a town and it's really this is a place called fisher store turns out it's not a town it's privately owned by the lady who lives right next door who will call the police on you if you try to camp there. Don't camp there. I did that and Hayes County Sheriff's Department came out and tried to chase me off. And I was very nice to the nice officer. And the nice officer was very nice to me. And he said, you know what, there's a post, post office right there. So just camp on the post office uh, lawn. So I did that because I told him, no, listen, you can put me in jail, but I'm not riding down Ranch Road 32 in the dark where there's no shoulder. And I know, because I used to live there, I know how fast people go down that road. So I'm not doing it. And so, yeah, yeah, just camp at the post office. So just be aware, don't try to camp at the Fisher store. Here's a low water crossing on the way to Blanco. Again, this is okay because if you look at the water, it's not like ripping through there. You can look at that, you just dismount, Walk it so you have more points of contact on the ground, not just your two tires. Walk it uh, carefully and slowly, and you know, you'll be all right in that sort of condition. More beautiful road. And here's Blanco State Park at flood stage. And you have to have a picture of a longhorn. It's just required. This is a little place called Albert, which is just really nothing except what you see here in the picture. And there's a place there on the right that has music uh, venue, um, drinking and music. So there it is. No place to camp. More beautiful hill country roads. Very quiet, very peaceful. Once you get out into it, it's beautiful. And when you come into Fredericksburg, there's a lot of different options. Fredericksburg is a town that has really tried to cash in on the whole tourist thing. So there's, it's the bed and breakfast capital of Western Hemisphere. There's more bed and breakfast than you can 
uh, imagine. My personal favorite is this budget host hotel. It's old school. Uh, looks like something out of the 50s. Uh, it's on the east side of town. It's right on the tour. Um, it's a great little place to stay if, you, if you're going to use a hotel. I did that night. I did it because of a huge, huge thunderstorm that blew through. So I just took shelter in a hotel. Other option is on the other side of town, and this is on the southern tier, Lady Bird Johnson Park has a campground. It's like $10 a night. I've stayed there a bunch of times. You can uh, shelter under this tree. I think it's the only tree in the park. There's a little shower there, a little bathroom facility. It's right next to a, a small runway. So if you like airplanes, you're going to love it. The Mitz Museum in Fredericksburg. More county roads heading out from Fredericksburg out to Lano. Wildflowers. Best time to see the wildflowers is in the spring. Different flowers bloom at different, different times. So you might see different ones, blue bonnets, all kinds of things. Mine, my favorite one is the uh, wine cup, the purplish kind of wine cup, beautiful flowers. Different times, different ones bloom. Crabapple is a little place called Crabapple on the map. When you get there, there may or may not be water, just like every other place along the route. Don't count on it. If you did this tour last weekend and you go out to do it next weekend and last weekend they had water, don't count on it being there this weekend. That's the way it goes here. When I went through the first time I did this, yeah, there was water and I needed it. Second time going the other direction, I got here expecting to find water, needing it even more, and there was no water. So you can't count on these little places having anything uh, that they had before. More beautiful scenery, the Hill Country, Enchanted Rock State Park in the background. Forget about going there during the spring. There's like a line of people in cars trying to get in during the beautiful spring days. Uh, you have to have a reservation to get in. It's off the route on a less than pleasant road to ride down. I'd give Enchanted Rock a pass uh, on, on it, seriously. Just enjoy it from the distance. Beautiful Hill Country. Another little place, uh, this was called Prairie Mountain Community Center. Again, I didn't even notice it my first time I did the tour. The second time, I desperately needed it because I was out of water. And they had water. There's no one there, but there was an open bathroom, and I went in and got, went to the bathroom and got some water. So if I did it next week, I wouldn't count on there being water because that's the way the hill country is. You get to Lano, Deer Hearn and Capital of the World, little museum, nice things to see there, beautiful scenery on the way out, heading towards Lake Buchanan, beautiful county roads, heading towards Lake Buchanan, a little place called Bluffton Store on the route, a uh, nice place, it's got food there, it's got bait, you can even buy a lottery ticket, lots of good stuff there uh, to stop at if you're doing the route. And there's a, a several LCRA, that stands for Lower Colorado River Authority parks along Lake Buchanan that have campsites that are worth, some of them are primitive, some of them have facilities, but that's an option along the route. This is Highway 29. And the reason I say to do this in a clockwise direction is because if you do it in a counterclockwise direction, you're on this road, and this is the best part, is the only good part of it where there's a shoulder. There's like six miles of shoulderless, non undivided, uh, four lane, high speed traffic, uh, and you're climbing uphill. And I found it to be nerve shattering. And again, I'm a long time rider, I'm an LCI, I ride in traffic to commute to work but I found this to be nerve shattering. Coming in the clockwise direction, at least you can take this really quickly on downhill and you're out of it in 15 minutes. So something to consider. This is Inks Lake State Park. Overlook, uh, there's shelters in this park. I think they even have some cabins. It's a nice little park, but it's one of the first parks to close if there's any kind of flooding going on. So you definitely wanna check the Texas State Parks website and check on this park because 
it, it, not, it doesn't take that much rain and this place shuts. You want to know about that. Big, huge hill going back towards Austin. More wildflowers. There's a whole bunch of little towns like this one's called Oatmeal. On your way into North Austin, actually into the little exurbs north of Austin. And here's what I'm talking about. The ACA map uh, puts you on some roads that I found to be awful. And there's a sign here that says 45 miles an hour. That's a joke. Nobody was going 45. There's no shoulder. It's high speed traffic. It's that kind of traffic that moves in platoons. So for a while you have the road to yourself and then you're slammed with a whole bunch of cars jockeying to get around you. So the person, even if the person behind you sees you, that person behind that person doesn't see you. And it's, it's quite dangerous and not pleasant. So if you go on to crazy guy in a bike website and you look up Texas Hill Country, John Coons, I posted maps that show you a couple different alternatives that you could take either using the light rail system or getting onto Ronald Reagan slash Palmer Lane, which takes you maybe a mile or so out of the way, but that has a huge wide shoulder and is a route that's commonly used by uh, people training, triathletes, weekend warrior types. So people are used to seeing cyclists on that. Here's me getting home with the dogs. Isn't that nice? Uh, then I just wanted to throw in a little thing here about the bike overnight that I was planning. This is kind of going to the east of Austin. Uh, I posted the map on the bike overnight section. I, uh, because of the COVID thing, I've turned this into a private event. So my daughter and I and my grandkids are going to do it. But the map is there. And this, this could be a great little option uh, for you. If you come down here and you want to go on to some quiet roads, the east side of town that are not all of the roads that are to the south that are on the actual Hill Country Loop Trail. So it's a 100 mile loop starting from North Austin, a halfway you get to Bastrop State Park, which is on the Southern tier. So there's that and there's the elevation thing. So it's, you know, not that bad. Uh, it's, if you go farther east from Bastrop, on the southern tier towards Buster State Park, there are some serious hills there uh, that, that you, you may end up having to walk. But they're short and steep. Not Again, not Independence Pass, but short and steep. So this is the hill, this is that uh, bike overnight loop. Just kind of show you the types of roads starting out from North Austin not too bad, big wide roads. Yes, it's fast, but you got a shoulder. And then you get to a little town called Manor and you're onto these kind of quiet roads. I know the guy that actually owns all this junk here. And then you're onto these beautiful quiet county roads before too long. Gravel. And then you get into Bastrop, which is another one of these little towns that's kind of cashed in on the tourist thing. There are lots of places to eat, lots of cool things. And you can camp out at Bastrop State Park and then head back through town. Again, this puts you on the southern tier. So relatively quiet roads. And then as you get back into Austin on this loop, again, you've got, yeah, some arterial roads, but there's shoulders. And then eventually you get into Austin and this is Springdale. And that's a lot of the route, a lot of cyclists. Pretty, pretty rideable, very rideable. And then you actually, the route I had marked out, you actually end on a bike path. So that is uh, some information about the Hill Country Loop. Um, I hope that people consider doing this. Again, I did this in five days. I should have spent more time. Fredericksburg is a great place to get to. Even if you were loaded down, you could use that, go to a, consider going to a bed and breakfast and then use that as a base camp. And then there's a lot of different rides you can do out from there, you know, as like a credit card tour to going out different places. So that's an option too. Uh, the best time to come, 
again, March and April, and then again in October. The weather we have here tends to be um, cold fronts will come in. And then after the cold front comes in, you'll get several days, up to five days of absolutely magnificent weather. So if you, if you could, the, if you had the ability to do it, the way to do it would be to like wait until to get here the day the cold front ends, passes through, and then do the tour. Because you'll, what you'll have is dry afternoons, cool mornings, chilly at night times. So you can snuggle up in your sleeping bag, but not, not cold, like not Minnesota cold, just kind of Texas Hill Country cold. Um, although it can drop down in the Hill Country. So if you're looking at what the temperatures are, be aware that out in the Hill Country, it's going to be about 10 degrees colder than what it says for Austin. So if you're looking at some weather service thing and you're looking at Austin, subtract 10 for the Hill Country. So keep that in mind. Um, hydration, very important. It gets very dry here when it gets dry. You can't count on water between the big towns. You make sure you have plenty of water, a gallon a day per person at, at the very least. And if it's dry, you're going to want much more than that. Um, those are some of the, I think, the main points to say about it. Again, I invite everybody to come on down here and do this ACA Hill Country Loop uh, in the southern tier sections uh, down here in Texas. And thank you for watching this. And I hope you have a great ride.